Hi everyone, thanks for coming. So today we're going to hear from CJ Collins and he's going to talk about his research on misinformation, expertise, and the cognitive load of fake news. Take it away. Thanks. And uh, thanks everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm excited to share this with you. I've been working on it for a while. Um, I'm CJ, like she said. And today I want to talk to you about uh, misinformation in the age of the internet and a pilot study I conducted about uh, the cognitive load of fake news. So first I'll do a little introduction, um, work through the history of fake news, answer questions like what is fake news and misinformation, and then I'll discuss um, the internet, social media, and echo chambers roles in perpetuating fake news and misinformation, and then some psychological correlates that motivated me uh, to conduct the study, and, um, and then I'll work through the study, how it works, uh, what it quantified, and then finally I'll uh, look at the future direction of the project and where I want to take it and how misinformation plays a role in um, societal perceptions of expertise. So first an introduction and so what is fake news and um, through my research I found that misinformation is more of an umbrella term and there are different subsects of misinformation and that would be disinformation so that's more like your propaganda it has political underpinnings more it's more targeted and centralized Fake news is your run-of-the-mill, things you'll encounter on social media, um, from disreputable sources. And then satires are things like The Onion. I'm, I'm sure some of you have seen articles from The Onion, or um, maybe Late Night TV, um, Saturday Night Live, something like that, where the, some of the, not, not everything that they're saying is true. Some things are, it's mostly satirical, but there aren't really any malicious, there, there's no malicious intent. So. This is a quote that I think is still applicable today, and um, although it was spoken in, or written in 1712 in uh, Jonathan Swift's book, The Art of Political Lying, he said, falsehood flies and truth comes limping after it, so that when men come to be undeceived, it is too late, the jest is over, and the tale hath had its effect. So I want to keep this in mind as we move through the presentation. Uh, and so, but first things first, fake news is, is nothing new. It's been around for a long time. Um, the term, although the term has not, was not explicitly used until around, um, we think, the 1890s, um, but misinformation has been used for, for a long time, and so I'll work through some uh, examples here. So in 1835, Richard Locke uh, authored a six-article series detailing the purported discovery of life on the moon. Of course, we know there's no life on the moon. Um, but at the time, uh, uh, many people believed this in the United States and Europe, and it was published in the New York Sun. And actually, three Yale scientists uh, bought into this idea, and they went, and uh, Richard Locke had actually claimed that it was published in the Edinburgh Journal of Science. And they went, and they tried to find uh, this discovery, and they, they figured out that the Edinburgh Journal of Science had been disbanded three years prior. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, that's a good historical example of what I would call fake news, so in that, in that circle that I was discussing earlier, and then more along the satire lines, we have in 1893, the New York Herald uh, published a 10,000-word uh, a article detailing the escape of animals into or zoo animals into Central Park, um, and this caused quite a commotion in the city. And then once again in 1894, we have what, from what I could find, one of the first appearances of the term fake news actually used, um, and this was in an illustration in Puck Magazine, which was a cartoon magazine. Um, and this was kind of right around the time when yellow journalism started to appear. Um, so these are kind of three examples that, that we should keep in mind. And then in 1938, uh, Orson Welles, the infamous uh, War of the Worlds broadcast where he, it was more of a theatrical um, display. Orson Welles was a director, an actor, um, and he put on this broadcast about an alien invasion and people actually, he, at the beginning of the broadcast, he said, you know, this is, this is all fake, um, you know, don't worry. And so people who had tuned in knew that, but then people who tuned in a little late didn't know, and it caused quite a, quite a stir. Uh, some people panicked, and uh, actually some people were injured. So this is a good example of how, and a good historic, historical example of how fake news can have real-world impacts. And that's something that I also want to keep in mind um, when we move to the more modern examples. But then, again, in 1999, um, right around the advent of the Internet, uh, you can see they said using a personal worldwide website. Uh, that, <laughs> that, 
it was, uh, the website was made to look like Bloomberg News, that website, um, but it, it wasn't. And they reported on this merger between Paragain Technology and this other uh, lucrative bu uh, buyer, and it sent the stock price soaring when in actuality there was, there was no such merger. So, uh, some more modern examples. This, uh, these articles, uh, the one on the left here is uh, the first report of this. Uh, you know, doctors apparently confirmed the first death caused by GMOs. This is obviously not true. Um, however, uh, another article actually did pick it up and uh, they, they were warning uh, consumers on how to avoid uh, the deadly GMOs. Um, and then something I also want to notice, so once we move into the, the internet and misinformation in the internet, we see um, a Facebook share count of 192,000. So that's actually a pretty significant reach. Um, on the Facebook community. So just another thing to keep in mind. And we have some more examples here. Um, <laughs> this was published about Bill Gates. So the Gates Foundation is um, a huge supporter of vaccines and healthcare uh, around the world. And this is a nice little, I guess you would call it meme of Bill Gates looking fairly nefarious. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, and then we have another example. Uh, this is something that these fake news sites like to do. They like to put out uh, public figures people like, people um, tend to listen to. And so Justin Timberlake, they made up these quotes. He said, mandatory vaccination schedules are completely un-American. Uh, <coughs> interesting. <laughs> but if we'll notice again, the share counts uh, on the Bill Gates uh, article, there are 49,000 shares on Facebook. Um, so one of the best and biggest examples, and this, this example uh, is more within the realm of disinformation, and this was a conspiracy theory. I don't know if any, if you guys heard about this, um, but the uh, Pizzagate conspiracy theory. This uh, this was created online uh, on message boards and forums, and it was this uh, this long narrative of all these interconnected pieces about how the Clinton uh, camp. It was it actually stemmed from the John Podesta WikiLeaks email. Um, uh, release and so uh, people online generated this conspiracy theory about how uh, Hillary Clinton and her supporters actually held a child sex trafficking ring within this in the back of this pizza parlor and so uh, hundreds of thousands of people online latched onto this and uh, so, so an example of something that they might have been reading uh, there are some fake news sites that put out articles like this um, and they were, they're long articles detailing all the interconnected pieces. And um, it's a very strange experience to, to kind of enter the wormhole and look at all, how these people are thinking. And, uh, and so actually, uh, it culminated in someone driving all the way from North Carolina to DC, where this pizza parlor was, uh, with uh, an AR-15, stormed into the uh, ping uh, to kind of ping pong and said, you know, I'm here to save the children, fired his uh, rifle into the ceiling. And uh, he was arrested. No one was injured, luckily. But this is a perfect example of how fake news can have serious uh, real-world implications. So now, uh, I think it's a perfect transition into talking about the internet and its role in perpetuating fake news, and specifically social media and echo chambers. So each of these, uh, I'm sure many of you use Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook. All of these platforms now have uh, features that allow you to look at news through the application, and so, um, of course, you can tweet and share things on Twitter. You can, uh, and now Snapchat has added this story feature where they actually have stories from uh, media and news organizations like Cosmopolitan, Wall Street Journal, um, The Washington Post, New York Times, and and then Facebook has, um, of course, you can share news and, and things on Facebook. My dad loves to do that, mm -hmm. I know, and um, <laughs> you can, uh, <laughs> And, and this is all, uh, keep this in mind because this is all part of this network that is formed around us without, without really thinking about it. And I, I, I believe that this is kind of a way that these echo chambers start to form. And so that's what I want to talk about uh, next. But before that, I want to look at an example of Facebook. And we'll go back to Bill Gates. Uh, we have another meme. Uh, this is posted by a page on Facebook called The People's Voice. Uh, <laughs> There's this whole, there's this uh, movement, or, or the anti-vaccine movement, that really wants to align uh, Bill Gates apparently with uh, trying to kill everyone with vaccines. Um, 
And so some of the, uh, so, so we have another, uh, notice the share count, and then we have another example of um, people that are truly convinced that vaccines are um, terrible and evil, and, and these are, I just love these comments. I mean, feel free <laughs> to read them, but I do notice that Beth, in response to Rita, said, join Stop Mandatory Vaccination. It's a great group. Um, keep that in mind, because we'll go through that later. Yeah, sometimes people aren't so nice. <laughs> um, okay, so, so these are two studies done, two separate studies done. Uh, the first on the left detailed how it was done uh, by researchers in Italy. They were looking at um, hundreds of thousands of users on Facebook, and they looked at, um, they found that more polarized users, the more active they were on Facebook, the more friends they tended to have that shared similar viewpoints. And so in that same vein, another study was done and, uh, that kind of detailed the basic structure. This is just the basic, basic structure, but you can imagine down here on the bottom right um, with this a, B, these ABC circles, you can imagine uh, each circle is a friend. Uh, they're sharing similar viewpoints and sharing the same kinds of information and articles, uh, perpetuating the same viewpoints, and everybody's, it's, it's building this um, community where it's reinforcing uh, these psychological correlates, which I'll talk about next. And so, these are really, these, these psychological uh, phenomena are really the reason I wanted to look into and try to quantify um, at least one of them, which would be cognitive fluency. But one thing I do want to mention before I get into how these are related, the illusory truth effect is this psychological effect in which people, um, the more you hear something, the more likely you are to just accept that as fact or accept that as part of your worldview. And then, um, Another, another. Uh, so, so that kind of plays into this echo chamber idea of how people are uh, pinging things back and forth, similar viewpoints, similar perspectives, and we're, we're starting to accept these viewpoints simply because we're seeing them more often. Um, and then, of course, cognitive fluency has to do with we like to do things that are easy, and especially mental, uh, cognitive-related, uh, associated tasks. We like to, to do things that are easy. It makes us feel good. Um, uh, of course, we'll, pay, we'll take the path of least resistance. So this, this got me thinking, and how these things influence echo chambers. So if, if we like things that are easy, well, of course, it's difficult to see things that we disagree with. We don't like, um, I, it's difficult to disagree with people about things because it's a, cha it's a challenge. And it introduces, um, uh, so, so naturally, we would want to confirm our pre preconceived uh, notions about things, and this is something uh, known as confirmation bias, where we search out, we search for information that confirms our um, already held biases. And then, um, so in line with disagreeing about things, we have cognitive dissonance, and that's when you encounter something that you don't agree with, but it's, it's challenging your worldview, and it creates these, there are two separate cognitions within your mind, and you're, think, you're, you're pondering this, this more difficult thing, uh, it disagrees with what you think, uh, but you already have this uh, bias and, oh, well, you must be right. So uh, in, <laughs> in the vein of cognitive fluency, it's just easier to accept the thing that you already believe. Um, and then when, when people do in, get, get in debates, and it happens in person and online, um, when you try to convince someone of something else and they have a very strong, strongly held opinion or belief, um, it can actually backfire. And so this is what happens online when um, debunking efforts um, so when people try to, so like websites like Snopes or fact checkers, when they go in and try to debunk these things, it actually, and so this happens in conspiracy theories when people are so certain of their beliefs and so certain that, oh, everything, everything must be a lie, everything I know, or everything they're saying must be a lie. Um, these conspiracies, so if you try to debunk Pizzagate, say, um, there were videos of people after it was debunked saying, you know, they're, they're lying, they're lying, it, it's all a lie. And so, these debunking efforts can actually strengthen people's uh, beliefs. And so now I'll talk about the study, and I wanted to kind of, I, I used uh, the NASA Task Load Index, which is a subjective workload assessment. And this, uh, this gave me a way to start to look at a, a potential method for quantifying cognitive fluency. And uh, these are the two articles I used. So what I did was I took a fake news article, which we saw earlier, a real news article on the same topic, and um, I pitted them against each other in allowing participants to read each article, and after reading each article, they would work through the cognitive or the task load index. 
And so, uh, first I gave them a pretest because I wanted to understand their basic mental methodology for working through uh, real news and fake news. Um, and then, how confident were they that they felt they could identify it? Um, and would they consider themselves an expert in identifying fake news? So I also wanted to see what people's perception of expertise was. And so the task load uh, index framework, they created it, uh, NASA created it to measure the cognitive and uh, subjective workload of their employees and their astronauts and uh, pilots in working with human machine interfaces. And there are two phases. The first phase is the comparative analysis phase, and this is what the students did first after they read uh, the first article, or each article, and it looks like this. So it would pit two variables against each other. Uh, so say temporal demand or mental demand, did you feel more of a time constraint during the activity or did you feel uh, it was more mentally demanding? And so say I did the study and I felt there was more of a time constraint. And so I would choose uh, temporal demand. Um, and I felt it was frustrating, uh, more than physically demanding because it was reading. And then um, it took more effort than I feel like I performed well on the task. And so then, after the comparative analysis, students would work, I mean, participants would work through uh, the NASA, this is the actual scale, and so they would just mark, make a, make a mark on the scale where they thought, um, they, what they felt during the activity. Um, and I know I'm moving quickly, so feel free to ask questions afterwards. Um, and then a post-test asking some of uh, the same questions that, I, that we had in the, in the pre-test. And, um, and I, can, I, can I know it's kind of difficult to read, but I can, give you a little more detail afterwards if you like. Um, so the results. A little uh, introduction into this. Of course, this is just a preliminary study. Uh, there are only 42 participants, so it's, it's difficult to draw any uh, concrete conclusions. And um, the, the participants were ISAT students, and um, there, I didn't impose any time limit on them. So the first question I asked was, will real news articles, and just specifically this real news article, carry a greater co average cognitive load than fake news? And um, it was the case. So there was a statistically significant difference between the um, average cognitive load of real news um, compared to fake news. So maybe we're, we're starting to think about cognitive fluency. Maybe it's easier for people to read uh, fake news, and that's why it's shared so often. And so then I wanted to look into specific variables, and I looked at mental demand. Was, it, was there an average high, or a higher average mental demand for uh, real news? And again, uh, it does, it, at least for this article, that was the case. Um, and then finally, um, did it take more effort to read real news? And once again, there was a st statistically significant difference between the two. Um, and then uh, in regards to the post-test and pre-test, approximately 93% of participants identified the fake news correctly. Um, and then before, before they went through the uh, activity, 10 approximately 10% identified as experts, and then after, only 7%. Um, and, and so there were some sources of error, and uh, particularly this first one, the Real News article was longer by about 300 words. So this could have, this could have had a significant influence on the outcome of the study, and so I did conduct a second trial, which I didn't have time to work through the data yet, um, where the word count was, was closer so we could focus in on just the content. Um, and the articles were presented in print, although they were first published online, so that could have uh, potential influence. There was only, um, the trial only con uh, contained one pair of articles, so this one pair, uh, of course there are you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, articles shared online, so, um, and then the introduction of the study actually mentioned fake news, which was an error on my part, and that could have heightened some students' awareness to, to the game. And um, so, so what does it all mean? It, it means, maybe, that real news is more difficult to read and comprehend. However, more, more research, work, and trials are necessary because there are, as I said, there are hundreds of thousands of articles out there. Hundreds, uh, there are different mediums. You know, how do people perceive video when people are just kind of talking at you and you're just absorbing information instead of really thinking about it? Um, and then there are, um, I, I would like to look at it in a, in a digital medium. How are people reading and, and how does looking at things on the computer or your phone affecting um, how you perceive things? Um, and then I would look at a, a larger sample of articles and. Um, and work through that. So in the future, um, I want to look at how misinformation affects people's perceptions of expertise. And 
So if we can go back to that join stop mandatory vaccination, um, of course I had to look into this group because I just found it so interesting. Uh, so this is what I got. I clicked, I, I searched it on Facebook, got that, went to their page. <laughs> And then I went to their about page and it said, when a, I like this part of the bottom, when a parent who has a vaccine injured child says to you, do your research, that's why this Facebook page exists. So you can do your research. Be brave, your children are counting on you. Um, that's another thing these fake news sites like to do. They like to give you an emotional appeal. Um, and they like to give a lot of these testimonials from parents who have apparently had children injured by vaccines. Um, and that it is, it's a, it's a strange experience to kind of work, go through the wormhole on this and, and look at this kind of community. Um, but the thing I want to end with is this, uh, th there was a comment here by a doctor talking about, you know, may maybe you guys should rethink your position on vaccines. They're very helpful. Um, and Rose, wonderful Rose said, uh, because, <laughs> Because you're a doctor, we are to believe you know the truth about vaccines. <laughs> I'm very concerned about the rise in autism rates. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this, this is kind of why I want to look into misinformation and, and expertise next. Um, so thank you so much for coming. And if you have any questions, Thank you, of course, to my uh, advisors. I couldn't have done it without them. And thanks to my family, because I yelled about this for a long time. So, <laughs> so does anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, do you have any, I, I love this, this is great. Okay. Great, great show. Do you have any sense of how the results might vary with different age groups? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I think they would. I think, I also, I also think they would. I think um, the younger we are, the more, ma the more uh, flexible we are in our viewpoints, and then, um, but I think it could go the other way as well. I think um, as you get older, you're more mature and you have a better sense of how the world works. And, and um, it, it, I, 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 do think it, I do think it would vary. I mean, and, my and sense that, is that younger, I think you have more skills of being able to identify some of the, the little warning flags. Or right. Whatever, whereas I think if you're older, you might completely miss those. Sure, yeah, absolutely. And I don't know if I agree with that completely. I think when you're young, you don't necessarily have, I mean, I think in some cases, but I also like to think as you get older, hopefully you you, 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 you get a little more sense of skepticism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you see like first person dies of GMOs, you might say, well, wait a minute. Right. You know, just, just having that, that sort of body knowledge. The, the other side of that, I, I'm sorry to jump into that, but just this was about a GMO and then NASA. Well, NASA, is a pretty credible source of information. Wait, 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 I'm sorry, what? So I'm going back on your different article. Your two articles mm -hmm. that you had people Yeah, read? I just used, uh, used the NASA framework. Yeah, used the NASA, the NASA framework. framework. Yeah, but, so. But, but that even, even of itself is, uh, I, I know, for your study. Okay. But it's NASA, so right. it's not just. Right. Yeah, so the source. Bad, the source, yeah. Source. Yeah, so I think. This is, this is one of the things why it's so difficult, is that yeah. there's so many Not different very variables very playing into this and it's difficult to quantify. And so that's why, that's why I suggested that there needs to be a lot more research done because there are so many different age groups, people encountering news in different ways. There's so many different mediums and everyone's kind of in their own little world no matter what we do. And so there, a lot more work could be done and I think it needs to be done before we can draw any real conclusions about about and the how environment people are in too, because they may have preconceived notions. Right. About exactly. What, yeah. And, and no matter what age you are. Yeah. So, yeah. I, mean, I thought your point about the length of two articles that the one was mm -hmm. almost was three hundred words mm -hmm. longer. Right. So that so definitely you could have had, had, had it. Right. Something of some substance. Because mm -hmm. again, it's presenting. There are more variables. There are more factors that come into play, and that takes more time to mm -hmm. read them, analyze them, think about them. Whereas a more simplistic vaccines are bad, don't take them, right. that, that's a bullet point. People right. can grab that in a, in a second and go with it or not, whereas a more detailed study or analysis of the information it takes time and effort and work, and right. who's going to bother with that? Exactly. So yeah. that's the danger to me of the social media and the Facebook, because they tend to just post those bullet points, bullet right. points mm -hmm. and just show this frightening image or, you know, a small blurb of something to be, vaccines yeah. to be afraid of, and then and then nobody really delves into it. They right. just read that and then there's a panic. So. Yeah, and so but w so one of the things I did notice was that <laughs> it was so difficult to find 
reputable news sources that had shorter word counts <laughs> than fake news. So it took it took it probably took me two days and like three hours a day to try to find on the same topic uh, similar word counts and be, because. Although I do want to measure it just on the content, if if real news is longer, that could be another reason why people don't engage with it as That's much as fake news. Sure. So, yeah. And you know, I will even say that I'm a newspaper reader. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that front page article. It's often not till you turn the page and get into the guts of the story that you that you're really getting into a lot of the information mm -hmm. being reported, right. and not those first two or three paragraphs, which are, can be very general. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks, Thank you, CJ, for your really yeah. fascinating yeah. presentation.